Well, <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, I'm, uh, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, I've met many of you in Uganda when I went to the trip there, and uh, I've had the honor of uh, knowing uh, Noah, and the very first Sunday that I was at KVC, Noah and Mary came, presented me with the Bible, prayed over me, and one of our uh, elders said, this is your boss. So I was like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. But Noah has been gracious, um, and uh, I'm just happy to be here. Um, I've actually been married for 42 years. One wife, Bona Safiwe, and uh, we do have two boys. One is single and the other is married. They're in the States. Um, my wife would come, but uh, for the last seven months, we've kind of gone through uh, some more deals with surgery for her, but she's on the men, and we praise God for that. So I want to talk to you today about transition. First of all, I hope you took notes on Chris yesterday, because what he said, there was some nuggets there that we need to heed and that we need to listen to. Um, if you'll put that first slide up of a car. That's a 1966 Ford Mustang, candy apple red. That's what I learned to drive on. How many of you have learned to drive a manual transmission car? Let me see your hands. Pretty much most of us. I have an older brother and a younger brother, and my dad would take us out when it was time for us to get our driver's license. So I had turned 15, and my dad said, it's time to go out on the dirt roads and learn to drive this car. And um, I knew nothing about gas, brake, or clutch. I just knew what they were, but I'd never operated one. My older brother went through it, got trained. My dad taught him, and he said, it's not as easy as it looks. And so my dad takes me out, and he drives on the dirt road, and he says, OK, Craig, you get in the driver's seat, and I'll get in the passenger seat. I get in, and I look at everything. He said, wait, wait, first you need to buckle your seatbelt because we're going to be shaken. We're going to be jarred. You're going to hit the brakes too hard, and we need our seatbelt on. And so he said, OK, put the cl first thing he said, he said, OK, on the right is the gas. I said, OK. He said, no, look. It's the gas. That's what makes the car go. That's what gives the gas to the engine. He said, next is the brake. What's the purpose of the brake? I said, to stop the car. Exactly. What's the purpose of the brake? To stop the car. And then he said, what's on the left? I said, the clutch. He says, what's that do? Well, it helps you to shift gears so you can begin to move and then go faster. He said, OK, remember that. Gas, brake, clutch. Because you're going to get in situations where you're going to hit the brake and you should have hit the clutch. You're going to hit the gas when you should have hit the brakes. Any of you been there? When you panic, when things are coming at you in cars, Krista talked about the traffic in Nairobi. I drive an automatic car in Nairobi. But can you imagine a person brand new learning how to drive, driving a manual transmission on Uhuru Highway? And it's rush hours traffic. And they're saying, hit the brake, and they hit the gas, or they don't push the clutch in, and the, the car chug, chug, chugs. So my dad says, OK, push the clutch in, push the stick shift into first gear. And you know, I hadn't even looked, where's first gear? So I had to look down, and my dad said, no, don't look down. You need to know by memory 
where the first gear is, second gear, third gear. Because in traffic, you don't need to be looking down. You need to know how to get into reverse. And so I began to learn that. How many of you know the first time I let the clutch out, it was smooth? If you believe that, I have some pl uh, land in Nairobi I'll sell you for free. <laughs> I mean, it was this. <laughs> and it died. My dad was a very patient man. He said, it's OK. Push the clutch in, start the engine, put it in first gear, slowly let your clutch out, and give it gas. What I did was, and I popped the clutch, and so we went bump, 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 bump. Eventually, I was able to transition to begin to smoothly move in first gear. Then I had to learn to go to second gear. And that was, again, a process of learning. But each from first to second, second to third, reverse was transitions that helped me get to the destination that I needed to go to. Finally, I reached the time where I was able to go to first, to second, to third, in reverse, smoothly. And then my dad said, OK, go up to the top of this dirt road and stop. And I did, and he goes, OK, now start out again. Panic entered my heart because the car started going back. Any of you guys relate to this today? And my dad goes, no, you got to slowly let the, the clutch out and put the gas to accelerate. Well, I popped the clutch, hit the gas, and rocks were flying everywhere. But eventually I learned how to take the car on a hill and transition to get over it. And so, just like me learning how to drive that car and learning the shifting or the transitions, as a body of believers, as churches here today, AVC, we have to learn how to transition in this season. I want to read you a quote. It says, today we honor our history but we don't live in it. We want to move beyond our history and into our destiny. We want our own story of God moving in our generation and in the nations. That was by the Anaheim Vineyard. The Vineyard has a great history. I've been privileged to be out to Anaheim and spend time with John Wimber and many of the staff. And he had an incredible impact in, our, in my life and my wife's life. And he's had an impact in many of you, the vineyard. And the history is rich and it's great. But in this transition time, we cannot rely on the history of the past. We have to move into our destiny as AVC. We have to move forward. And even though it may be jerky, and even though we may kill the engine, so to speak, and even though we may not transition well, and, we, and the gears grind, and we come to a stop, God has called AVC in this generation for a purpose and destiny. Yes, we, en Whoa. Yes, we embrace our history. See, with Noah, this never would have happened. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, that's right. This is a, the Edwards School of Music Stands. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just put that there. That's good. Yeah. So we have a destiny. We have a purpose. And transition is not easy. This transition from Noah to Edgar hasn't been easy. But yet transition is essential 
if we're going to follow God, if we're going to move like in Joshua 3, where he says, when you see the Ark of Covenant move, you move too. The thing is, as we move, we may hit seasons of floods. We may hit seasons of chaos and confusion and doubt and unbelief, but we have to continue to follow what God's doing. Jesus what I see the Father doing, the truth is, in our churches, we do a lot of things that God's not even doing. And we call it God. And we call it anointed. But God has called us to transition. But even though it's hard, we have to learn as a movement how to do it peacefully with grace and dignity. We have left people on the side of the road, wounded and bleeding because we have not transitioned well. It has happened in my life over all these years of ministry. I can name the names of people that were left on the side because of politics, because of religion, because of all these things instead of holding to the face of Jesus and the presence of Jesus in our bodies. You know, God is cyclic. He moves in cycle. He doesn't have a beginning and an end. And because of that, our weather, our uh, different seasons tell us and speak to God. There are the natural times when seasons change. We're in the season here in Kenya where we're praying fervently, fasting for warm weather. Aren't you fasting for warm weather? Ah, and it's going to shift. It's already begun to shift. And God is a God of seasons, and there's times when there are seasons for us to move quickly. Even as Edgar said last night, there are times and seasons we wait as Psalms 46 says, it says, be still and know that I am God, that I'll be exalted in the heavens. I'll be exalted in the earth. There are those seasons where he says, now is the time that you step out of the boat and you follow me no matter what. You don't look to the left or the right. You look straight at me and go forward. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says that we are being transitioned from glory to glory. And in the midst of the glory and glory, there's pain, there's struggle, there's doubt, there's questioning, there's confusion. Pastors, it's time we let our body know it's okay. Quit set preaching a gospel that's not the gospel at all. We preach a gospel that's real and relevant to our time, and it meets the needs even in this COVID season. Chris said yesterday that he believed since the Reformation that this is the greatest time in the history of the church. When he said that, my spirit leaped because when in March of 2018, when this hit, or 2019, and then my spirit, the Lord said, this is an opportunity for the church to transition and become the church, no longer about buildings, no longer about titles, no longer about politics, but it's about Jesus. It's about him. It's about his heart for our cities and nation, desiring that Jesus would come and be exalted in our cities and nations. I believe with Chris, with all my heart, and this is not hype today, it is the greatest opportunity for us, for the Vineyard Movement, to start a movement afresh, by the power of God, the Spirit of God, where worship begins to come, not somebody else's worship, but begins to flow from our Levites, that begins to flow from their heart, and there's new songs being birthed. 
There's new messages. We're not just regurgitating the old revelation, but God's given us fresh revelation. We're preaching manna that people can eat and feast on, not the leftover bread. And so I believe that in this transition, we are in one of the greatest times in the history of the church. And it will not look like yesterday's movement. Isaiah 42 and 43 says, forget the former things. Behold, I do a new thing. For the last year and a half, AVC, pastors, have you realized God's doing a new thing? What we did doesn't work anymore. We weren't even on, KVC wasn't on social media or on a live streaming back then. We did the social media. We had to rethink how we were going to do it. How are you going to reach people? And then how do you reach people in the slum areas that don't have the data? How are we going to reach them? See, it's, we, Chris and I are talking, it's urban but also the village. The gospel is to be preached in both areas. We have to reach our people. He says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? This last week, just as a way of going back to my roots, I listened to John's testimony. It's about an hour and 28 minutes. If you've never listened to it, I recommend just you can go on YouTube. And it reminded me what God was doing. It was a new thing, bringing healing to the body, priesthood of believers, that it wasn't just the pastors doing all the preaching, but the body of Christ was laying hands on one another. The sick was being healed. Demons were being cast out. You see, my background is Baptist. We never talked about the Holy Spirit. I never laid hands on anybody and prayed for healing. Then God got a hold of my heart, and I saw a whole new revelation of a part of the body that I had never seen. Paul says in Philippians 3, forgetting what is behind, I strain for what, ahead, what is ahead of us. That's transition. There's a shifting. Listen, some of you today need to forget the past. Some of you today, AVC, not that we don't relish the past and we remember it, but we're not holding on to it. It's like a string. If I hold on to this string and hold on to my past, when anything that hits that triggers me, I get pulled back to that. It's time to cut the strings and to say, God, what is the new thing you're doing? What are you saying? What are you saying in the village churches? What are you saying to the churches in the urban areas? What are you doing right now? How is church changing? And when I say church, please, please get out of your mind a building. It's not a building. The new thing, God is arising, waking, stirring in the body. It's us as the people of God. We don't need a building to advance the kingdom of God. I'm not anti-building. I love having a facility. But if we believe that that's the key to a great movement, we've missed the heartbeat of God. It's its people. Transition's hard. They force us to deal with the familiar. We have to deal with the familiar and our comfortableness of where we are. My wife and I, three and a half years ago, sold everything to move to Nairobi. And there was a little bit of uncomfortableness, even though we knew God was calling us. Because we had been in North Carolina for about 19 years. And it felt good. It was comfortable. Things were going well. But yet, all of a sudden, there was a transition. And it wasn't easy. I'm going to be honest with you. It wasn't easy saying goodbye to our siblings, our mothers, a church that I loved, and coming. But yet, in those times of shifting, God was there and he was faithful. 
We have to identify why we resist change. I had Edgar come to our church to preach and introduce him. We had to have a big throne up at the front, and we gave him a scepter and a crown. He demanded all this stuff. There was a list of things that he needed. You know, he had to have certain types of water there. I'm just kidding. He didn't. But he stayed with us, stayed with Pam and I. We had a good time just to catch up and fellow, fellowship. But this transition from Noah to Edgar has not been easy. Personally, I think Edgar should have kept his dreads. But I understand, and Edgar's a better man than me, he went the high road. But we gotta begin to transition even from culture and tradition to what is God saying and doing. We don't ignore it, we don't discount it, but the gospel always takes precedent over culture and tradition. Now, pastors, I should have heard an amen out of that. I'm stepping on some of you's toes. And it was a difficult transition. Edgar shared some of the things, even the things directed at him personally. But yet, it wasn't easy, it wasn't difficult, but I believe with all my heart that Edgar is the man for this season. And whether you like it or not, God has ordained this time, and there is a transition going on, a shifting that Edgar and the team are going to have to navigate and hear the voice of God and move us forward as a united body. Every transition has a time of ending. It has a time of chaos and confusion and working out, and it has times of new beginnings. This weekend symbolizes new beginnings. It's the old handing off to the new and transitioning. All three of them handled by themselves can be difficult, but when all three of these can come together, it's like a spiritual assault. And we have to know how to handle those. It's like the sons of Issachar. They understood the times and seasons that they lived in. And most of the time we stop right there. But it says they knew how to implement. We have to learn in this transitioning to no longer be stopped in the middle of this, but to go forward and implement the strategies and plans of God. So I want to talk about three major mindsets that hinder transition. Number one is com comfort. I'm, I'm like you. I like comfort. I have my own special chair in my house. Not even my dogs get in it. My wife dare not get in it because it's mine. It's comfortable. It fits my body. And that's the way we are. We get comfortable in our season, in our churches. And the convenience and the challenge of transition takes us out of that comfort stage. Paul says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The word press, it's the idea of straining. The picture is of horses on a horse track, and at the end of the finish line, they're straining to win the prize. Everything within them is pressing forward. Listen, comfort stops us from believing God's word and, and moving forward out of our comfort. Number two is fear. If I've heard more during this last year and a half of COVID is I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the COVID. I'm afraid I'm going to get COVID. I'm afraid of this. Listen, you all, COVID is a virus. It's real. 
but so was the black plague, so was the yellow fever, blue bonic plague, it was all real. But the body, those people began to learn to, even though it was there, to move back into their lives. The church continued to move forward. We cannot walk in fear. We have to walk in faith. It's like in a movie that's suspenseful. Part of the best part of the movie in a suspense movie is not knowing how it's going to happen. The unknown. Once you know it and you watch that movie again, it doesn't have the same effect. And fear that tries to paralyze us and stop us, then once we know where God's given us, we face that fear and it doesn't have that hold on us. Number three is sentimentality. Some people don't transition because they'd rather live in yesterday's familiar revelation than to seek God for the new revelation that's here and now. You know, Noah and Mary have done an incredible job. When I first met Noah, I knew him as a man of peace. That's the first thing the Lord said. And he's a man of prayer. He's a man that seeks the heart of the Lord. And that has been a blessing to AVC. He and Mary together, walking, ministering to the people that were hurt, disenfranchised. And as good as they are, we've transitioned in a new season. We can't go, well, you know, Noah used to do it this way. Well, you know, Noah said it this way. Edgar didn't even talk to me today. Edgar did talk to me today, by the way. He even prayed for me, so that's good. We can't go on this sentimentality that says we wish for the good old days. Listen, since I've come, KVC has transitioned into a totally different church. And in that transition, there were difficulties. I'm going to be honest. There are times that I cried before the Lord. And I said, Lord, please release me. Let me go back to the U.S. But yet I know this is where God is taking us. And I could have said, oh, we long for the good old days. I don't want the good old days. I want the God-anointed days that press the darkness back that takes back that what the locust and canker worm has stolen from us. No longer to sit and hold hands and sway and sing, Kumbaya, my Lord, Kumbaya. Listen, it's time we stop singing Kumbaya and we start singing, we're going forth in the battle. The battle belongs to the Lord. We are overcomers in Christ Jesus. So lastly, <laughs> Chris, really, this is lastly. <laughs> there, there's four things, four things that will help us in this new season. Things that you could write down, things to preach in your church when you face transition. Number one, accept that transition is inevitable. Transition is inevitable because without transition, we don't have victory. Without transition, we don't move. We just put the car in neutral and rev the engine and it sounds good and it sounds hot, but we're not going anywhere. That, that uh, transition is inevitable, whether we like it or not, but we need to embrace the transition as the best thing God has for us. Number two, embrace the risk. Risk is spelled F-A-I-T-H. Faith. Faith. To take a risk. Whatever you think of Peter and the disciples in the boat, the other knucklehead stayed in the boat. Peter said, bid me to come, Lord. Jesus said, come. He gets out of the boat. Peter was walking on the water. How many of us here today have ever walked on water? I have with skis. I've skied behind a boat, but that doesn't count. 
We haven't, and it takes risk. And when God is telling us in this season to come, we need to say, Lord, bid me to come. ABC cannot be a movement that rests on the past. We need to chart our destiny going forward. Number three, expect negative consequences. I've been... I started in ministry in 1979. And if one thing has taught me is this, whenever you dare to do something for God, people will criticize you. They criticized Edgar, he's too young. Well, Paul told Timothy not to let anyone look down on his youth, but to set an example by speech and deed. It criticized the process. But God in the midst of it moved. And whether you like where it's at now or not, it's time to say yes, Lord, and begin to move with God. There will always be those that will sit up in the stands in your churches and criticize you when you dare to believe God's word and you begin to transition. And you may not do it well, you may uh, pop the clutch, you may chug and the car stall, but you keep going. You push the clutch in, start the car up, and move forward. Number four, move forward in spite of it all. You know, there's only one way to go through transition, and that's to go through it. You can't hope it goes away you can't pray it away. You have to go through it. Just like the Israelites in Joshua 3, they had to get up when they saw the ark move, the presence, the manifest presence of God then, and when they saw God move, they needed to move with it. And you know what happened? They came to a river that was at flood stage, and I can hear the critics, I told you, we should have just stayed right there. Look at it. It's that flood stage. We're all going to die. We're going to drown. I don't know how to swim. How are we going to handle it? And God said, step into the waters. And so when God is telling us as a movement, whether it's urban or in the villages, when God says move, we move in obedience, whether we see it. God told Abraham in Genesis, he said, Abraham, get out of there. Even if you have to go, go by yourself, get out of there. Where am I going, God? Don't worry about it. Get out of there. He leaves. Where are we going, God? Don't worry. I'll lead you. That's where we got to be as a people, as a church. When God says go, we don't have to have it all figured out. Because in the transition, there will be bumps speed bumps all over Kenya. I don't know why you all have speed bumps. But there'll be speed bumps. There'll be road signs. There'll be construction. There'll be traffic jams. But none of those things stop us from our purpose and destiny that God's called us. Not just here in Kenya, in Tanzania, in South Africa, in Uganda, in, in uh, in uh, other places all around us. We have to find that season that we're in and then let God lead us. Winston Churchill said this. He said, never, 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 never give up. Don't quit. And that's what I close with today. AVC, we, we have a, a great vision. We have to implement. We have to walk in unity and harmony. Lay down your titles. Lay down your positions, because they don't get us anywhere in the kingdom of God. Lay down this pride and arrogance of that you've been called by God, he called us to be bond servants and slaves. 
and that when Nakuru Vineyard succeeds, guess what? KVC succeeds. But we've been jealous of one another. Well, yeah, KVC is this and this and this. We're just a body of believers. It doesn't mean we're any more special or more privileged than you are. We are ordinary people. Trust me, I am an ordinary guy. When I wake up in the morning, the angels do not pick me up and put me in my trousers and button my shirt. I have to do it myself. Can you imagine? We're in transition. How are we going to handle that? Are we going to move forward? Or are we just going to put it in neutral and idle? Would the worship team come on up? And if you would stand with me. This is a, an incredible way to transition. We're going to take communion. Now, some of your churches may do it every week. We do it once a month. Doesn't matter. He says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And communion is a great way of saying we are united. We remember the sacrifice that Jesus has done for you and I. We remember how he paid the price so that you and I as brothers and sisters can walk this journey of life and that we can walk it in unity and harmony. And when there are disagreements, we sit down at a table and we discuss. But we do not leave the table as enemies. We leave as brothers and sisters. And so we're going to take communion together as one body with Jesus the head. We're going to take it. First Corinthians says, when you come, you're coming wrongly, and you've not rightly discerned the body. That's why many of you are weak and sick. Pastors, we need to rightly discern the body you shepherd and the corporate body of Jesus Christ. And we need to confess, Chris had us confess our sins and lay down those things and confess them. There's healing. Jesus died for our healing, for our sins, past, present, and future. And so we don't have to carry bitterness. We don't have to carry offenses. We don't have to carry where we're looking at this other church and we won't even talk to them. Listen today. If you're here and you have something against another church, a vineyard church, that's here, I want you to man up and go to them and say, forgive me. You see, we take this, but we make light of it. It's a mockery. And yet we still have hatred in our hearts for our brothers and sisters. We come and we say, we take the bread and the juice and we pop it and we go on. But he says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance. Remember what I accomplished for you and I's freedom. It's for freedom that we've been set free. So take the bread. And Jesus took it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat.
He said, this is my blood shed for you. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And as often as you do this, remember, remember what I did, how he was a man that was despised and rejected, scorned, that he was beaten, he was mocked for you and I. And he said, disciples, on that night, remember. Let's take it. So we're going to have a time of worship. And this morning, I want us to pray for those that need prayer for physical healing. If you need prayer for physical healing, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Now, for those that haven't raised your hand, look around. Look around. Look behind you guys on the first row. Here's what I want. Not the pastors praying. I want the body praying for these people. That's one of the things that I loved about John is the priesthood of believer. Just because I'm a pastor, I don't have more anointing than you. You have the anointing and the Holy Spirit within you. Like Chris was saying last night, activate your authority that God has given you. So we're gonna do body ministry. So you guys keep your hands up again. Just begin to move right now around those people. Lay hands on them. Go ahead. Come on, body, move. Everybody that's got their hand up has somebody praying for them. And believing. Ask, ask that person, what do they need healing for? We're not going to pray aimlessly. We're going to pray specifically. Father, right now, we release your healing vir virtues in this place. God, just as in the early days of the vineyard, people were not getting healed, they were getting sicker, but there was a moment in time when John prayed for a lady with fever and he turned to the husband and was beginning to say why it doesn't work and she's up making her bed. God, today, let there be suddenlies in this place. <clears throat> let there be healing. There's healing in the communion, the atonement. There's healing today. Lord, do, do it. Do it again and again and again. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you.